It's great to be with you today. My name is Frank Wagner, and we are offering worship today, and I hope that you benefit from it. And if you do, why don't you share it with somebody else and make them aware of what a great church Holy Spirit Lutheran Church is. I want to bring your attention to some new things that are happening here, and maybe you would like to participate in it. This coming week on Tuesday and Wednesday, we are offering a new small group called It Came From Within. We're gonna take a look at some of the emotions and some of the thoughts that come from inside of us that aren't always real helpful. In fact, they can actually be very destructive if we don't understand them and take control of them. Things like jealousy and anger, um, guilt, those can be very destructive. So we're gonna look at them from a biblical perspective and how we can handle those kinds of emotions better. Also, another small group is going to be offered. It's called You Drive Me Crazy. Uh, Jamie Johnson's going to offer that small group on Wednesdays starting June 23rd, 6.30 p.m. Everyone's invited. And what that one's about is we all have people that drive us crazy, that make us go nuts at times. What do you do with people like that? What does the Bible say about that? Of course, we want to be able to find a way to diffuse it and to be able to get along with people that can be difficult. It might even be you and me that are the difficult ones. So I encourage you, check out You Drive Me Crazy. Maybe you'd like to participate in helping us to celebrate, celebrate Christmas with 600 children over in Haiti. And you can do that right here. We're going to have a Christmas party where we are going to make Christmas cards for all of those Haitian children at the Village of Hope School. That Christmas party is on June 22nd at one o'clock in the afternoon. And we'd love to have you come here to the church and we're gonna have a Christmas party and we're gonna make Christmas cards. And then the last announcement, very important, is that if you have a bicycle that you're not using or you know of someone who does, we would like to have that bicycle and put it to some very good use. Do you know that there are a lot of people here in Palm Beach County, they can't afford a car? So a bicycle is their major mode of transportation. So if you have a bike, bring it here to the church or give us a call, we'll come and pick it up and we'll make sure that someone needs it can put it to good use. Thanks, let's get started now with our worship service. Let's go. Let's join together for the brief order of confession and forgiveness. The Holy Spirit calls us together as the people of God. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen.
Today we want to celebrate our tiniest graduates. Congratulations to our Holy Spirit Lutheran Church preschool graduates. We wish you the very best of luck next year as you enter elementary school. We're so very proud of you. Well, as everyone knows, we are in the season of graduations and there is no graduation closer to my heart than to be able to watch our preschool children graduating from BPK. Uh, those beautiful five-year-old children uh, touch my heart every time. So I wanna thank the people of Holy Spirit Lutheran Church for providing us with this preschool ministry. The intent of our ministry to these little children has always been to be a very clear, decisive Christian ministry to them, to love them with the love of Jesus Christ. So even though education is very important and we do that very well, we wanna make sure that these children know that God loves them and that they gain a good foundation of the basis for that love. Uh, we meet with the kids every week and have a chapel experience with them. Uh, they learn uh, songs about the love of Jesus Christ. Uh, they learn scripture verses as well. They learn how to pray. So they are surrounded by the love of God in their week-long experience here in our preschool. So people of Holy Spirit Lutheran Church, you are making a difference in these young lives here in our community. Thank you. Each day's done. 
The reading today is from Exodus chapter 33, verses 12 through 23. Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. He said, My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go, do not carry us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, unless you go with us? In this way we shall be distinct, I and your people, from every people on the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Show me your glory, I pray. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you the name the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will be, show mercy on whom I, sh I will show mercy. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, See, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. This ends the reading. Good morning. Please pray with me. God, we are grateful for all the ways that you grow our faith and that you don't leave us stagnant. We'd ask that you would help us to recognize significant events in our lives in which you intervene and you cause growth in us and help us to give thanks for those moments. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. We are continuing our sermon series on how God grows faith. Today's topic is how God grows our faith through significant life events. I doubt that this is news to many of us. The birth of the first child is often such an event, that moment when you are present for new life, he or she being placed in your arms or on your chest, perhaps you still tear up thinking about that. Contrastingly, a death of someone close to you can also be such a time. It causes us to think about our own mortalities and stirs up questions we've preferred to keep at bay about our finitude and frailty. A health event, a cancer diagnosis, a heart attack, a stroke, any can force us to dig deep into what we really believe about God's presence and or absence in our lives. Significant events force us to take seriously what we believe about God and causes us to wrestle with how much we truly trust God, particularly when it's a challenging life event. I hope it doesn't surprise you that scripture supports the idea that God grows faith in significant life events We'll drill down into a few particulars, but I want to start with something that I think best summarizes this teaching technique of God's using life events. It's the reading we just read from Exodus. Moses has just led God's people out of slavery in Egypt. The plagues, the Red Sea crossing, the manna in the desert and water from a rock, I'd say a pretty significant life event. I'd think Moses' faith would have grown a bit. And still, still, he makes this request of God to see his face. And God responds, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before the name the Lord and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy, but, he said, you cannot see my face, 
for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, See, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. This is how I understand what God is telling Moses and us. You probably won't see God coming at you, but you will know when God has been there. As a significant life event is approaching, you probably won't say to yourself, I believe this thing that is starting is going to be significant. But once you're in the middle of it, or it has happened, in hindsight, we are finally able to see how significant that event truly was. The new job you started, would you have realized at that moment that one day it was instrumental in you starting your own business? When you were on the bus to Luther Rock, would you have realized at that moment that one day your Luther Rock experience changed your life for the good? One of the significant life events for me that has continued to shape my faith to this day happened 26 years ago at my ordination at the seminary in Columbus, Ohio. Maybe that doesn't surprise you that his ordination day would be significant to a pastor, but mine happened in an odd way. I had done my internship in Orange Park, Florida, a suburb of Jacksonville. I had a wonderful year with that congregation. That congregation called me a year later to serve as their associate pastor. I asked my supervising pastor, Dave Winter, if he'd come up from Florida to Ohio and be part of my ordination service, which was a few months before I would start my call as associate pastor. And of course he agreed and I was excited. So the day of my ordination arrived. I was busy making sure everything was just right. My family was trickling in, food was arriving, worship participants were showing up and needed to be rehearsed for their roles. People from my home congregation in Northwest Ohio were starting to roll in. I was scurrying all around the chapel. And then I noticed a couple from Orange Park I'd been close to. They surprised me by coming up for my ordination. I only had a couple of minutes to chat with them and thank them. After all, I was busy fussing over things. A few minutes after that, another family from Orange Park showed up. They too came to surprise me, saying that they had already planned to be vacationing in the Midwest and just added this stop to their itinerary. Again, I had a couple minutes to chat and thank them, but I was busy. You know, this scenario happened one more time. I just couldn't believe that these people had taken this much time and made this kind of effort to come from Florida and celebrate this day with me. About 15 minutes before worship was to start, I went into the sacristy to get my robe on. The sacristy was about the size of a classroom, so there were a few of us in there getting ready. This room had a window that overlooked the seminary parking lot. A couple minutes after I stepped inside the sacristy, as I'm putting on my robe, my supervising pastor, Dave, came up next to me and said, I think you should take a look out in the parking lot. And I turned to look out the window, and there in the parking lot was a tour bus spilling 40 more people from that congregation in Orange Park, Florida. 40 people who had taken time off work, riding 800 plus miles on a bus, just to come and celebrate the ordination of their new pastor. I did not see that coming. How could I have imagined something like that when I invited Dave to come be part of my ordination? I think back about that day a lot, particularly when there are trying days as a pastor, to think about how that congregation offered such an outpouring of love, just because. To think about how God has given me so many gentle and not so gentle affirmations along the way. Formatting like that at the beginning of my ministry as to what God's people are capable of. 
It's crafted a vision for me of what congregations can be like. But it was hard to see that vision until it happened, until God had been there and passed by on a bus. Hindsight shaping my foresight. That's what I think significant events do for our faith. With those significant experiences, we see how God has worked, how God can work, and it gives us something to lean on when we face the next situation that will require our faith and trust for God to be who God says he will be. And we know that difficult experiences shape us as much, if not more, than pleasant ones do. In fact, as a pastor, I often hear people talk about how much they learned and grew from challenging significant events in their lives. Seldom do I hear them say that of easy times in their lives. And the Bible is full of those stories too. The first Bible story that comes to mind for me about that is the story of Joseph in the Old Testament. His story begins in Genesis chapter 37. You may recall that Joseph was one of the youngest of 12 brothers. He shared with them that he had had a dream where he ended up ruling over them. And you can imagine how well that went over. They already didn't care for him because he was their father's favorite. The dream was the tipping point. And as you may remember, the brothers sold Joseph into slavery. I'd say this was a terrible, significant life event. There's a lot that happens between that point and the end of the story that I'm jumping to. Joseph has ended up as Pharaoh's right-hand man. A series of events elevated him to this powerful position. And because of his position, he was able to save his brothers and their families from famine. And the story with Joseph ends this way. The brothers are worried that Joseph will attempt revenge on them. And he responds, even though you intended to harm me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he's doing today. Joseph speaks with a grown faith, a matured faith, a faith that saw how God turned something horrible into something beautiful. Please understand that I don't think God sends us horrible experiences to teach us a lesson. I think horrible experiences are the result of a world stuck in sin. Bad decision of our own or bad decisions of others produce painful results. Bodies that are frail and fragile endure horrible injury and illness. A world that is yearning for redemption is going to let us down. But in any of these challenging situations, God can come in and do amazing growth in our lives and teach us amazing things and bring about amazing outcomes. The Apostle Paul wrote about a persistent challenge he had had and how God answered. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. If your pride is a problem, sometimes it's only when you get broken that finally you can hear that God, what God has been saying to you. When we are finally brought to our knees, God can show us we only walk forward because of him. The book of James begins, My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. James understands challenges as opportunities. Through them, we can be matured and grown. We can develop endurance for all the good and all the bad that will come. I pray that we only have to endure good to come, 
But statistically, as humans, we know there will be some bad too. So maybe it's not helpful to try to diagnose events as either bad or good. A farmer and his son had a beloved horse who helped the family earn a living. One day the horse ran away and their neighbors exclaimed, your horse ran away, what terrible luck. The farmer replied, maybe so, maybe not. A few days later, the horse returned home, leading a few wild horses back to the farm as well. The neighbors shouted out, your horse has returned and brought several horses home with him. What great luck. The farmer replied, maybe so, maybe not. Later that week, the farmer's son was trying to break one of the horses and she threw him to the ground, breaking his leg. The neighbors cried, your son broke his leg. What terrible luck. The farmer replied, maybe so, maybe not. A few weeks later, soldiers from the National Army marched through town recruiting all boys for the army. They did not take the farmer's son because he had a broken leg. The neighbors shouted, your boy is spared. What tremendous luck. To which the farmer replied, maybe so, maybe not. We'll see. I think my point is this. Any significant event in your life, God can use. Maybe our focus should be less on trying to determine if it's good or bad at the moment, but rather, how is God using this moment to deepen my faith? What lesson is God offering? How can I see God was present here even though I didn't see God coming at me? How do I know God has been here? Back in the Old Testament, the prophet Jeremiah wrote to God's people who had been essentially captured and taken into exile in Babylon when the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel and Judah had fallen in 721 BC and 582 BC respectively. The unthinkable had happened. The holy city of Jerusalem, where God lived in their minds, had been overtaken. They were separated from it and now were foreigners in a strange land. They couldn't imagine things getting much worse. And Jeremiah writes, For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord. In whatever circumstances we find ourselves, God has plans for our welfare, not our harm. Plans for a future with hope, not despair. Or the way the Apostle Paul puts it in Romans, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God. Whatever situation you find yourself in right now that's stretching your faith, God is growing you. It's for your welfare, not your harm. If it seems dark, hold on. If it seems bright, seek God more easily. Does it seem bad? Maybe so, maybe not. But I promise you, God is there. Maybe his hand is simply over you as he's moving by. And then you'll know God was there with you. This isn't the time to pull back on your faith. Let it be grown. Amen. We now join together and confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. 
and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join with me now for our closing prayer. Gracious Father, thank you for doing life with us, all of life, the good, the bad, the challenging, the hard. Thank you for always being a part of what matters to us. Thank you, God, that you use every situation as an opportunity to be able to grow our faith. Nothing is lost in your hands. We know your promise that you will make good out of even those things that are difficult and hard and bad for those who believe and trust in you. And so, God, as we do each day, help us to be aware that you are doing every moment of it with us and that your goal, your hope for us is that our relationship, me and you, that it will grow stronger and that it, you will use every opportunity to be able to strengthen our relationship with you. Father, we celebrate with all who are graduating. We know that there are young children in the preschool who have graduated, as well there are children in high school, and then there are college students, and there are, are those in all kinds of professional situations that have reached a milestone in which they have worked hard and they have accomplished wonderful things. Behind all of that, though, is you. You are the ones who have provided those educations. You are the ones who provides the schools. You are the ones who provides the means, the resources, in order that we can have an education, that we can learn more. And Father, we know that we are blessed to be in a nation where there is so much opportunity. And I pray, Lord, that as we take advantage of these opportunities, that we always do it with thankful hearts, that we don't do it with a sense of entitlement, that we realize that we are blessed, that we are fortunate. And I pray, Lord, that as we are learning so much more and accomplishing these great milestones, that all of it is with a sense of how can I now give back? With all that I have learned and experienced, how can I bless others? For I have been bless blessed. Lord, may we show our gratitude to you. May we honor you in the way that we use this education, this additional training, in order to be able to help and serve others. Father, we want to lift up to you the sick in our congregation and amongst our loved ones. We pray for Karen Hutchinson, Bill Hertzik, Barbara Vetti, Walt Shin, Phyllis Mooring, Chuck Vaccaro, Helene Wheeler, and all the names that we lift up to you now from our own hearts. We ask for your healing hand to be upon each one of them. We ask for comfort for their family members who love them. We ask your guidance for the medical teams who are responsible to them. Lord, it is our prayer that you make them well, but you know in your perfect will what that looks like. And so we seek your will to be done in each situation. We pray for those who are grieving, especially for the family of Maxine Richardson, who passed away this past week. We ask, Lord, that you bring comfort, that you bring a sense of joy, Christian joy to their hearts, knowing that Maxine has now received her eternal reward and lives in heaven with her heavenly Father. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive now the benediction. May the God of all grace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
Bless you now and forever. Amen. Yeah.